All right. Welcome, friends and comrades. Daniel Tut here. I am the very pleased to welcome Landon Frim and Max Tomba to the Marxism and the Radical Enlightenment debate. Um, this is actually an event that is long in the making. Uh, this is a debate which is looking at the question of philosophy in political struggle, what the left and the Marxist tradition is to make of the legacy of the Enlightenment. I've decided to give the title of the debate uh, Marxism and the Radical Enlightenment, uh, which is a distinction from the historian Jonathan Israel in his extensive work on the history of the Enlightenment. For Jonathan Israel, uh, there was a moderate and there was a radical uh, Enlightenment beginning in the 17th century with the Glorious Revolution on through to the French Revolution, up through to 1848 and the worker uprisings, and of course, beyond. Led by atheism and the pantheist controversy and the philosophy of Baruch Spinoza, the Radical Enlightenment refers to an unwavering universal support for individual liberty, freedom of expression, the eradication of religious authority, the overthrow of slavery, and of the aristocracy. As Jonathan Israel writes, the ideas of the radical enlightenment led its proponents, not only in Europe, but actually outside of Europe as well, to quote, heroically champion basic human freedom and dignity, including that of women, minorities, homosexuals, and religious apostates. So the idea is that uh, reason and rationalism that came out of scientific revolution in Europe was also used to defend the status quo. So we immediately see that the legacy of reason and the enlightenment has a contestation within politics, both in Europe and beyond. For Marxists, the legacy of the enlightenment has also been drawn under a lot of suspicion. For example, in their 1947 book, Dialectic of Enlightenment, Theodore Adorno and Max Horkheimer argued that the Enlightenment celebrated reason, and this led to oppressive and inhumane forms of governance. Uh, Adorno and Horkheimer believed the Enlightenment's goal was actually to understand and to exploit nature for humanity's end, and they believed that the Enlightenment was split, the split between nature and society, this dualism, uh, actually destroyed the foundation of reason. More recently, there's been a lively debate on Marxism and the Enlightenment in Spectre magazine, which was initiated by Landon Frim and Harrison Fluss's article, Reason is Red. It had several interesting responses from Aaron Jaffe and William Clare Roberts, um, who have disputed this legacy of universalism, of Spinoza, and of the Enlightenment in any conception of Marxist practice today. Um, I've decided to invite Max Tomba to offer a perspective and Landon Frim to offer a perspective on how Marxists in today's day and age are to respond to the legacy of the radical enlightenment. This is going to be a uh, very exciting interview, a very exciting debate rather. Let me start by introducing our guests. Um, Max Tomba is chair and professor at the History of Consciousness Department um, at UC Santa Cruz. His research examines time and temporalities, Marxism, critical theory, critical theory, especially the first generation of the Frankfurt School and contemporary political thought. Uh, Max is the author of several books uh, and most recently, uh, and of uh, particular interest to this debate, I've released for public consumption the introduction to his book Insurgent Universality, an Alternative Legacy of Modernity, published with Oxford University Press in 2019. It, this book was the co-winner of the 2021 David and Elaine Spitz Prize for the best book in liberal and democratic theory. Uh, Landon Frim is Associate Professor in Philosophy at Florida Gulf Coast University, and he is a specialist in Spinoza, Enlightenment Rationalism, and 
He has written in popular outlets, including Jacobin Magazine, The New Republic, Salvage Magazine, and Inside Higher Ed. With Harrison Fluss, Landon wrote Prometheus and Gaia, Technology, Ecology, and Anti-Humanism, which is an examination of the ideological positions of futurism and eco-pessimism. You can catch a great interview I conducted with Landon and Harrison uh, for Zero Books on their YouTube channel, as well as on the Emancipations podcast about Prometheus and Gaia. Okay, the way that format will work is I will pose a question and offer Landon and Max both a chance for a statement. Some of these questions will be directed to one of them. Some uh, will be for both of them to answer. If it is directed to one of them, they will both have a chance to respond to what the other says, keeping it short on the response. But in your uh, opening uh, questions, you can feel free to take your time. So again, gentlemen, thank you so much for agreeing to join me today. I want to begin by getting our bearings on this, on your perspectives on Marxism and philosophy. How does Marxism need philosophy and or why does Marxism need philosophy? Or really does Marxism have no use of philosophy? Let us begin with Max. Okay, thank you. And first of all, thank you for having me. And uh, I'm sure we will have a, a very interesting debate. So I think I think uh, in a few words, I think the relationship between Marxism and philosophy, or the way I see this relationship, is a, as a as a kind of a tension, productive tension between the two. And uh, and uh, obviously, my mind goes back to thesis eleven. And uh, and uh, the thesis says that the philosophers uh, have only interpreted the world in various ways, and the point is now to to change it. So this is not uh, a separation between philosophy and politics, in my opinion. It's uh, I think it's more what I said about the possible tension. I would say there are two or two maybe more dimensions in this uh, thesis. Uh, I would say, uh, first of all, uh, we need a philosophy that provides an interpretation and representation of the world that makes it possible to change it. So we need a philosophy, and this is my first point. So the meaning is that we need a philosophy that uh, is able to open up uh, possibilities for transformation. How is possible to open up possibilities for transformation? I think uh, uh, we need a again. We need a, a, a philosophy, a representation of the world that uh, is able to combine uh, what I would call uh, invariance and variance. So there are dimensions that uh, uh, obviously change historically, and there are other dimensions that we can call or we can define as an invariance, or as I like to say, uh, different dimensions with the, which change at a different speed. And that creates a kind of a temporal clash, tension because uh, I think there are not all the dimensions that we consider they proceed and they and they change at the same pace. Uh, maybe there is a, even a, a further element uh, that has to be considered in this kind of a materialist approach to philosophy. And, 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 and this is something that uh, uh, I would call it um, self-reflexivity. The term is not present in Marx, but, there is a there is a footnote in Marx in which he says something that is uh, extremely interesting to me. Basically, he says that uh, <clears throat> Descartes look at the world from the perspective of uh, manufacturing. So, for that reason, Descartes could have a representation of the world as a mechanism. 
And we can think that at the time, you know, there was a uh, Lamaitre who wrote the book, uh, the L'homme machine, the, the, the mechanic man. So that representation of the world as a gigantic mechanism was uh, possible because uh, the daily experience, not only of the theorist, the, the, but the, of, the, of the common man was uh, through these new technologies. I think uh, I think uh, this is an interesting uh, uh, insight, and I think we have to keep this insight uh, open, and we should work with this insight today, in order to understand how how and why we represent the world in a certain way. What is the kind of a transformation in our daily experience because of new technologies and new forms of productions that it makes possible for us? to see the world in a certain way. And then we produce, obviously we produce sciences, we produce the theories, we produce everything, but in a certain way, we are in this kind of a self-reflexive circle in which the transformation of experience uh, provide, uh, is, is basically, we can say the cause for a, a change in the representation of the world and that creates this condition of possibilities for new understanding of, of, of the world and new, and new sciences. So I would say uh, this, uh, this is how I see the, 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 the relationship or the tension between, between Marxism and philosophy. Um, yeah, that's it. Thanks. And uh, thank you, Daniel, for setting this up. I do appreciate this kind of opportunity. There uh, should be more of these, I think. Um, but thank you. Um, look, you know, uh, to the, to the question, does Marxism need philosophy? I have a very simple answer. The answer is yes. Uh, in fact, I think any, any manner of doing politics requires philosophy because in my opinion, philosophy is about ultimate justifications. Um, part of the reason why Harrison and I wrote reason is read is because of what we see as a, uh, something like a pervasive uh, anti-intellectualism in general, but increasingly on the left. Uh, I've noticed this, um, <clears throat> I've noticed this in my students and, and frankly, it disturbs me. Uh, especially incoming freshmen, freshmen who I haven't had a chance to talk with and have, uh, you know, <laughs> upper level seminars with. Um, I've noticed this idea, this tendency of students to be absolutely cocksure in their politics, uh, but almost be, uh, you know, moderately offended when asked to defend their politics. Now, th there's this idea that they're on the right side of history, they have the right allies, they uh, embody the correct positions, but when asked to uh, justify what those positions are, um, there's almost this idea that uh, to justify it, well, how can I put this? To justify their position opens them up to critique. And because they're on the right side of history and because they're defending the right side kinds of people uh, to offer a justification and therefore to open themselves up to critique uh, is, is a kind of risk that they don't want to take. I would put it like that. Um, so when we wrote Reason is Red and said that, look, uh, politics of all kinds, but especially Marxism, politics requires justification. You know, as, as Daniel said, we got a number of, uh, you know, often very strident responses. Uh, one of those came from William Clare Roberts. And, you know, uh, with respect to uh, Roberts, uh, one of his lines, one of his lines of critique specifically, uh, well, frankly, that was really jaw dropping to me. And, and I wrote it down here because I don't want to misquote. Here's what Roberts said with reference to justification, ultimate justification for one's politics. Roberts said, but for finite intellects, finite intellects such as us, this justification can never come in the form of knowing that we are right and that our enemies are wrong. And, you know, I would just ask the audience to think about that notion for just a moment. Um, first of all, I'm not sure what it means properly. The idea that, yes, perhaps in some sense we should justify our politics, we should justify our Marxism but that justification does not entail knowing, again, the direct quote, knowing that we are right and that our enemies are wrong. Um, well, I'm sorry, but I don't know what justification means. 
Okay, unless it means something like that you know that you are right, that your political position is correct, and those uh, opposing you are wrong, right? If you are critiquing capitalism, then your justification should entail something like that there is something alienating or exploitative about capitalism. If you're critiquing misogyny, homophobia, or racism, if you're critiquing anti-trans discourse, well, no, I'm sorry. One should understand why those who are homophobic, racist, those who are anti-trans, in fact, are wrong. It requires something like first principles. Any manner of politics, I believe, requires something like first principles. And yes, as I've seen in my uh, students, this is dangerous. This is threatening. You try and hold your feet to the fire. You develop an argument, and ideally an argument from first principles, to defend your political stance. You might be outflanked. There's a risk there, right? You might find that your positions um, have holes in them. They need to be modified, that they need to be strengthened. Um, but that is the risk we need to take if we're going to be intellectually serious. Max, uh, you mentioned Thesis 11, right? Philosophers up to this point have only interpreted the world in various ways, but the point is to change it. In your words, uh, one must open up or search for ways to open up possibilities for uh, transformation. Um, look, I, I agree. We don't need to merely interpret the world. We need to change the world. But from my uh, humble point of view, or perhaps not so intellectually humble point of view, um, this is a U-turn. So yes, we don't need to merely interpret the world. We need to change it. Very good. Next question. How do we change it? For what end and in what way? What kind of world are we living in? And what is the nature of the good life that we're aiming for? These just are philosophical questions. Um, and, and looking at the empirical facts, looking at the situation simply is not enough. A lot of people live in the same economy and they have different ideas about what should be done with the economy. And we watch the same news stories and we see refugees dying in the Straits and the Mediterranean Sea around Fortress Europe. We see an increased militarization just this week, discussion about the U.S. southern border. Uh, the, the collective punishment that is occurring right now in Gaza. Okay. Um, why should we care in a universalist way about people who don't speak our language, perhaps don't share our culture, uh, inhabit geographies that are extremely far away from us? Like, is there a basis for that kind of universal solidarity? And I think if there is an answer to that, that answer is going to come largely, if not exclusively, from philosophy. Just very briefly, I would say uh, when it comes to Marxism specifically, um, and not politics in general. Right? There is this idea in Marx of an invitation to the workers that the workers of the world should unite. That's a very simple slogan and it's often mindlessly repeated. But that simple slogan contains a lot of information. Okay, so first it's workers of the world. It's a universal statement about universal solidarity across all parochial boundaries. But not just that, it's the workers. It's the workers of the world. Workers are one identity among many, but not just one among many. The workers as an identity is a special identity. It is, uh, in the Marxist tradition, the universal class. It is the class struggle, the material class struggle of the working class that carries within it the seed of a future emancipated universalist society, a classless society, a society where, in Marxist terminology, uh, human uh, existence can match up with the human essence finally, can achieve something like a unity with its species being, with its proper role in the world. Um, but look, you talk about universal solidarity, a universal class, species being, human nature. These are philosophical terms. So the question is not, do we need politics to do philosophy? I, I apologize. Do we need philosophy in order to do politics? The question is merely, um, should we do it well? Should we take philosophy seriously? Um, you know, and, 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 and finally, this idea, because Max mentioned time, this idea in Marxism that we have an intelligible world that we can intelligibly track the transitions and the transformations from things like ancient slavery to feudalism, from feudalism to capitalism, and perhaps based on that, predict a future socialism, a future emancipated society. Um, this is a philosophically laden claim as well, right? The idea that history proceeds by way of the present and present tensions transforming into future conditions. 
uh, as, as unfashionable as it is to say this, this is uh, wholly in line with the Spinozist idea of a deterministic world. The very uh, mechanistic, although that's a dirty word, is a mechanistic, uh, really efficient notion of causality, that the tensions now produce the situation later. This is not messianism. This is not religious providence where the future pulls us forward to some goal. This is not a sort of quantum indeterminacy. This is not uh, the great wills of the great heroes of history. This is a, a, a very philosophically laden idea. And uh, well, so the question is, is that idea, is that intelligible universe, the notion of you know, a determinate intelligible world that you get in people like Spinoza, but not only Spinoza, but you get in the uh, radical enlightenment, is that idea correct? And therefore, is the politics, the sort of Marxian politics, which emerge out of that idea, is that politics justified? So again, uh, with respect to uh, William Clare Roberts, we need to know, are we right and are our enemies wrong? And uh, frankly, we can't know that unless we take the risk of doing philosophy. Thank you. Thank you very much. Max, I want to turn to you. Uh, for your response, Landon uh, gave a very nice little overview where he almost intimated the position that he defends in Reason is Red, which is a position of Spinozian monism, or the notion that political emancipation must rely on a priori uh, ontological basis to ground our knowledge of, let's say, the exploitation that occurs within capitalism. Max, let us start with you. Landon already intimated, and we're going to let Landon elaborate on that. But since we just heard from him, would you please give us your uh, critique or concerns regarding the foundation of one's philosophical outlook based on monism? Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. So uh, let me let me start by uh, going back one second to uh, what uh, um, Landon just uh, said. So uh, I, I agree, I agree with him when, and I, I agree with his concern about uh, the politics of uh, the young generation, let me put in these terms. Uh, I, think, uh, I think that more than the fact that they believe to be on the right side of history, I think what they believe is that they represent the correct moral standpoint. Uh, and I think uh, I think that there is a today a moralization of politics that, in a certain way, and is easy to show how and to and to, to to demonstrate how, basically. Uh, is a is a form of a neutralization of a, of a politics uh, in the terms of preconstitute uh, oppositions uh, like uh, what is good, what is bad, what is right, what is wrong, and so on. And there is no reason to justify one side or the other because the justification is based on individual moral assumptions. And uh, you know, if we talk about the so-called left, they can justify their moral standpoint by saying, "Oh, but we side with the with the oppressed," and then you can have a, a long list of oppressed people. Um, I think that there are two things that uh, philosophy, if we want, has to do. The first one is, as I said before, is a self-reflexivity. How did it happen? How our politics has been replaced by morality? How this moralization of politics took place? Uh, and this is a this is one thing. The second the second thing is that uh, uh, I think there is something highly disturbing in uh, this uh, emphasis on the oppressed. Uh, there is a way I read the thesis twelve. We're, I started with thesis and I proceed with thesis. This is thesis 12 by Benjamin now. And I think it's not by chance that is the thesis 12. I think there is a connection with, with the thesis 11. 
Mark's thesis 11. So if I, if I, if I, if I remember correctly, thesis 12, Benjamin's 12th thesis uh, say something like this, that uh, the, 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 the subject uh, of, uh, of the historical knowledge is the struggling oppressed class. What is going on in many interpretation of this uh, passage, and people like to cite Benjamin. Benjamin is like a like a like a like a salt that you put in every every kind of food just to give some taste, and uh, and uh, and people cite Benjamin and cite his uh, passages, but they usually forget that Benjamin is talking about the struggling class. And this is my second point. It's not the oppressed class, it's the oppressed class that struggles. And, and I think this is the second point. Uh, again, back to what uh, London said, how do we change the world? Uh, I would say, first of all, that uh, we can change the world if uh, we position ourselves not so much from the point of view of the oppressed, but from the point of view of the struggling oppressed. I think Marx didn't invent the class struggles. It was there. In the, in the preface uh, uh, of the first edition, if I remember correctly, of a Capital Volume 1, he said something like this, that uh, uh, what is the difference between Ricardo and himself? It's not that he's smarter than Ricardo. Probably he thought he's smarter than Ricardo. But uh, the, the difference between Ricardo and Marx uh, is that uh, is the intensity and the extension of the class struggle. Marx could see things that Ricardo couldn't because of the intensity of a class struggles. So I think this is, a, again, a very interesting and, and absolutely important insight. And today, from my perspective, is, uh, OK, we have to look at the uh, uh, event in which insurgents are changing the world already and are creating and are producing for us new tools, new concepts, new categories for this change and this transformation. So this is my approach to philosophy. Uh, now back to in, 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 in 30 seconds to your question, uh, monism or Spinoza, I think most of my Italian friends are Spinozists. And, uh, and, and, and we have an amazing conversation. Uh, uh, I, think, uh, I think my approach to, if you want, enlightenment, the tradition of enlightenment and the history of philosophy is, uh, is that a, the history of philosophy, enlightenment included, and Spinoza included, is for me a kind of a, a, a Kampfplatz, is a, is a battlefield in which basically our, 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 our task as a, as a critical philosopher, critical theorist, or whatever we want to call ourselves, is, uh, is to see Spinoza as a, an ally, but not only Spinoza. I would say the point is today is to reclaim uh, Hegel and, 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 for example, you know, I come from more or less the Italian workerist tradition, the, the intellectuals in that tradition, they were working with uh, uh, Hegel and Schmidt. They basically read together Hegel and Karl Schmidt. And uh, something that the Tronti always said is that basically we have to take all these uh, uh, big thinkers, which belong to the field of the bourgeoisie, but we have to take them and bring them into our field and, and, and use them as allies. Uh, I think this is still my attitude. Uh, I think it's not, uh, for me, to me, it's not a, a Spinoza or Kant. I think uh, uh, there, is a, there, is a, there, is a, there is a radical reading of Kant that is possible, and I want to use it. There is a radical reading of uh, the Romantic that is possible. Again, Benjamin's starting point was with uh, with uh, basically with the most conservative side of the Romantic. He, he sided with the Schlegel and these people, and, and why not uh, uh, Fichte? And why not uh, uh, Machiavelli? And why not Giordano Bruno? So I would say, and this is my conclusion: 
the left made a gigantic mistake, I th again, is a, is a moralistic mistake, by excluding people and basically pushing away a lot of thinkers because they were not, uh, very often because they were not uh, politically correct enough or they were not good enough for uh, 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 some purpose. And I think that is a double mistake. First, you don't engage with these thinkers and the kind of a theoretical tools they can give you. Second mistake, you give these thinkers, let me be dramatic, to your enemy. You give all these thinkers to the right wing or, or, or the liberals or the conservative, and they know how to use it. They are not less smart than us. They will use it. And basically, they will say thank you because you just dismiss a gigantic part of the history of philosophy because it was not morally correct or, 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 or it didn't, it didn't uh, fit your uh, uh, current representation of the world. Landon, I want to turn to you. Based on what Max just articulated, yeah. this sounds what sounds like what you and Harrison refer to as methodological pluralism, for which you are critical. Yes. If that's true, please respond. And also, please take a minute to make your case for monism or the notion that emancipatory politics must rely on a priori ontological basis. Sure. So, please. Well, let me be um, extremely unfashionable for a moment and defend, if not moralism, then morality or ethics. Um, look, I think we just simply use categories very differently. Uh, you say that uh, morality involves a neutralization of politics. Um, on some basic level, I don't know what that means. I think that... Uh, if politics is about achieving in time and space a better kind of society so that people can live a better kind of life, well, as far as I can tell, this presumes some kind of idea of what the good life is, uh, uh, you know, what it means to live a flourishing existence. Uh, that, that's morality. That's ethics, simply put. And, and in addition to that, and, and this is why I think politics involves... Um, something like uh, an a priori philosophy. In fact, I would say metaphysics. One cannot have an idea of what human flourishing is without an idea of what humanity is, uh, what the human essence, or to use a more Marxian phrase, what the human species being is. Um, and that idea of human nature, if it's not to be entirely unmoored, sort of atomistic, encapsulated uh, in and of itself, has to be understood within the larger picture not only human nature, but nature as such, metaphysics. What is the nature of reality of which we are intimately a part? Because we are not, as Spinoza says, in an imperium in imperio, a special state within a state, a special kingdom within a kingdom unto ourselves. So far from neutralizing politics, morality sets the goal of what politics is meant to achieve. And morality cannot exist without a general idea of what human nature and nature is in general. That's my basic picture. I can go into the specifics if you like. Um, but what, I, what I'd really like to do is to ask, you know, Max specifically a pointed question, which is, um, if morality, the notion of the good, and, and of course, let me, let me just make a caveat. You know, I, I think we can agree on the small questions, right? So the sort of moralism which says we should throw canonical figures in philosophy you know, into the dustbin of history because they said something which by 21st century standards is impolitic, is, is politically incorrect. I think um, we, can, we can largely agree that we don't want that kind of narrow, petty moralizing. Okay, but, but let's not equivocate on words, right? I, so moralizing, sort of petty moralizing based on individual women opinion is not the same thing as morality. Morality, if taken seriously, is not the absence of justification in favor of an individual whim. Morality precisely is a reasoned, justified defense of what you think the good life is. And politics is how to achieve that good end. So far from neutralizing politics, you know, um, it is int intimately bound up with morality. Morality gives the lifeblood to politics. So my question, again, to Max is, uh, 
directed from ethics, directed from uh, separated from morality. Uh, what is left to your category of politics, a politics that by your uh, taking is not neutralized? It, w it, it appears to be something which is uh, pure excess, pure sort of play of will, pure creativity. In fact, you say because I did I did my homework for this, although last week. Um, you say very clearly in your writing that there's no such thing as a human nature apart from this sort of excess of uh, political deliberation. Well, if there's not a human nature and therefore not a stable human good, but only this sort of cre free creative process of doing politics, um, then, then how do we know that we've succeeded? In fact, not only succeeded, how do we know that we're even aiming in the right direction, right? The Stoics have a saying that if you don't know where your ultimate port is, then no wind is favorable. Well, that appears to be the case here, uh, that if you don't know where you're uh, aiming for, what kind of society, what kind of life you're aiming for, in fact, that's what neutralizes politics. That's what unmotivates politics, and it becomes a sort of free, creative, perhaps aesthetic play but not really something serious, not something that can involve justification. Now you say, for example, that you don't like the idea of siding with the oppressed. I've heard that a lot, fine. I, you, other ways, in other places in your writing, you say you don't like the idea of identifying people merely as victims, fine. Uh, what do you offer as the alternative? You say uh, you want to uh, focus on the oppressed class that struggles. Okay. So again, my sort of impolite question is, um, why? Like, is it just a choice or it, why, why the oppressed class that struggles? Why not the oppressed class that doesn't struggle? Why not the master class that struggles? Like, so, so why is it with your politics, which is diremptive from ethics, do you choose to have solidarity with not the non-struggling oppressed class, not the struggling master class, but the oppressed class that struggles. Now, I might, in fact, agree with you. Perhaps I do agree with you about the ultimate conclusion, but I don't see what the justification is. Again and again in your writing, you have this turns of phrase, uh, we have to, we must, it is urgent that way. Um, but my question again and again in the marginal notes was, why? Why do you need to do that? Why do you need to develop this novel conception of uh, time as overlapping, as sort of tectonic, why do we need to deal with the provincialization of Europe? Uh, you say again and again that you must, you need to. Um, well, so, but the question is like, why? Why Why any of that? Now, the, the rationalist, the, the radical enlightenment thinker, the, to my mind, someone in the tradition from the Stoics through Spinoza and beyond, they have an answer to that. That answer is grounded in human nature, right? We have solidarity with other human beings because we have a fundamental identity with them in the one intelligible reality that we all inhabit, monism, right? I am not like my neighbor, I am my neighbor in some significant sense. And as I necessarily care about my own welfare and flourishing in very determinate ways, I necessarily care about the flourishing of the other because they are not other. Uh, but if you jettison the idea of human nature, you can't say that. You've taken away that justification for politics, right? Um, and so I want to know, well, then, then what is your justification? Max, please. Okay. A moment to respond. Yeah. Uh, okay. I think, I think, uh, I, I make a distinction between uh, ethics and morality as not that uh, it's not my original invention. I, I basically I follow I follow I would say I follow Hegel on this, and uh, and, uh, and I follow the distinction between yeah you know, morality and Sittlichkeit. Morality is for me, uh, and for Hegel, is uh, is based on individual consciousness and the perspective of the consciousness uh, uh, from which you can. As I said, you can have a, a, a distinction between what is good and what is uh, what is wrong. From the perspective of a morality, you have a right to to question what you consider wrong, and uh, and so on. Is a 
is a modern morality uh, 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 is extremely uh, individualistic and is based on the, on the individual consciousness. I think, by the way, it's even interesting to to point out the fact that uh, even the word consciousness became singular and uh, individualistic only in modernity, Western modernity. In Middle Ages uh, and before, con consciousness was a conscientia and it was related to something that we share. So there was this uh, morality, modern morality is the result of this individualization. I think it's not by chance that uh, in Greek there is no word for morality. Uh, what is ethics then? Ethics, uh, uh, ethics has to do with uh, obligations and commitment. We are part of a, of a collectivity or a community. Uh, politically, in the 19th, 20th century, we were, we, we were part of uh, parties and unions. The meaning was you have a commitment, you have obligations. You don't even need, you don't even need to think of what you have to do. It, it, was, a, it was a part of uh, the Sittlich guide of this uh, collective institution. Problem, some, many of these collective institutions have been destroyed. Result, instead of uh, this uh, ethical commitment, we have a more and more individual moralistic standpoint. This is just a partial explanation. Uh, now to the question, uh, what is my politics or why do I side with the oppressed class that struggle? Uh, I will say why, because, uh, because, uh, for, because we have, and, and, and pro, I'm pretty sure we can share the parts of the strengths, the critical part of our discourse, what is untenable in the capitalist mode of production? What is untenable in the, in the modern state? We can use different tools, but we can <laughs> fundamentally agree that there is something substantially untenable, unjust in this system. And, 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 and having said that, uh, we need a past constraints. We need a, something to build an alternative. What does it mean to side with the oppressed class that struggles? It means that there is, a, there is a legacy. This is the subtitle of my book, An Alternative Legacy of Modernity. There is a legacy of uh, past struggles, past attempts of uh, liberations, and that creates a kind of uh, ethical obligation and commitment. If I am a part of that legacy, that legacy becomes my gigantic community and I have a commitment. Uh, in, in my translation of uh, Benjamin's uh, uh, language, I would say uh, I have an obligation towards the past and the dead. They tried to liberate not only themselves, they tried to liberate and emancipate us they were crushed, they were repressed, they were massacred. Is my commitment, is my obligation to try to achieve now what it was not possible for them? So I think, uh, I think, uh, I think uh, for, to me, to keep alive this um, legacy, tradition, memory, the tradition of, a, of, a, of a possibilities and struggles is what can give energy to the present and the, and the orientation and the kind of a compass. There is a direction where we have to go. And the direction, para paradoxically, but without a, a paradox, the direction is given by the past. Uh, okay, there is more to say about uh, the other, but I'm sure there are other opportunities. Otherwise, I take too much time. Can, can, can I just ask a, a quick follow up? Clarification? Uh, briefly, please. Yeah, I mean, so without going into all of the details, um, you said that, you know, and this is the move that I often hear. Well, we can all agree that certain things are untenable today. Um, no, no, wrong. I don't think so. I think a lot of people, uh, 
you know, step outside the university and academic bubble are very content with how things are. Other people are discontent with how things are, but in very disparate ways. I've just got finished grading 180 term papers. I have people who are discontent on vaguely anti uh, immigrant, xenophobic, Malthusian reasons. They need to close the border immediately. I have other people who are discontent, but they're Christians. So the struggle that they want to propose is uh, finding your reward in heaven because the world is fallen. And uh, they're each part of their own zittlichkeit, ethical communities of commitment. And I want to know, do you have a reason for choosing between them? Is it justified to be a, a xenophobic uh, anti-immigrant person or a messianic Christian as opposed to, a, let's say, a socialist or an anarchist? I, I just don't see where the justification is, except that uh, you're part of it. Well, a lot of people are part of a lot of rotten communities. Yeah. So, so what? Yeah. Okay, very short answer. May I, Daniel? Please. <laughs> uh, I would say, yes, I think today religion, not only Christianity, religion has been weaponized for anti-immigrant and sexist, uh, homophobic uh, statements. Again, I think the left has to blame themselves. Why? Because uh, because there is a there is a, a tradition. If I go back, you know, when when Daniel pointed out what is the the, 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 the tradition of enlightenment according to Berlin, it started from the English Revolution. If I go back in the English Revolution, I find my friends, if you want, and they are the diggers and Win Stanley. If you read the manifestos of the diggers, every couple of lines, there is a citation of the Bible. So the point is, religion is not in itself a tool for the fascists. The point is that the left has abandoned religion in the name of a secularism, in the name of whatever you want. And this gigantic thing that is called the religion that is a full of emotional energy is now in the hands of the right wing. The point is that we can keep trying to persuade people that religion is bad. I would say, let's see, I don't know. I, my, 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 my reaction is a good luck. I would say maybe we should take back some of uh, uh, this uh, tradition that goes from Win Stanley all the way to Weitling and Landauer is, is huge. It is a four, five, 500 years of a socialist attempt which use religion. Uh, what do we want to do with that? This is my question. This is, if you want, this is my question to you. What do we want to do with the religion whereas large strata of the populations are religious people? Just, just to, to respond, just to be clear, in no way am I saying that we need to automatically jettison traditional discourses, traditional vocabularies, traditional ways of thinking, uh, just as a matter of course. All I'm saying is that we need, and I've not heard this thus far, justifications for which traditions we approve of and which we don't. So with reference to the English Civil War, do you ally yourself with the diggers and the levelers, or in many instances, the equally religious royalists, with reference to uh, the abolition of slavery in the continental United States. Do you ally yourself with the Christian defenses of abolition? There were many. Or the Christian defenses of chattel slavery? There were many, right? And so what we need is not uh, some kind of discourse about what kinds of vocabularies are in or out. That's not what I'm interested in. What I'm interested in is what is the justification based on human nature and the human good by which you affirm something like the levelers as opposed to the royalists or something like the abolitionists as opposed to the pro-slavery Christians? And unless we have an idea of what human nature is, what the human good is, is based on that human nature, then we can't make those decisions in any way that is not simply, uh, well, chauvinistic, simply, simply question begging. And, and uh, I'm sorry, this idea of uh, criticizing the young generation for their moralism because it's their sort of individual whim. No, this is what leads to that. It's not the left trying to develop an intellectual apparatus of progress and universalism. 
that's the cure, right? The disease, the reason why people are disoriented and demoralized and think that all they have is their own humble opinion uh, is because they have lost faith in objective reason, in, in, an, in constructing an objective and defensible worldview. And, and that's where your morality and then subsequently your politics should come from. Okay, I want to shift gears slightly to open up the question that Max has written on quite a lot, uh, and which I think will will pose a, a, a positive point of contrast between the two of you, which is the question of teleology, and the or or the notion that history can be explained post facto through the development of certain principles, um, or that uh, there is a sort of um, teleological stages of history, right? And we know that there are many almost mechanistic accounts of history uh, that, that bring this certain type of universalism to bear. I think that Landon is not necessarily in favor of that, let's call it vulgar Hegelian notion, um, but let us hear from Landon first, and then let us get Max's response regarding the, the question of Marxism and teleology. Landon, is Marxism a teleology? Why or um, why not? So, so is Marxism a teleology? Do I believe in teleology? Uh, let me uh, just say that it, uh, it obviously depends what we mean by the word teleology. Okay. If by teleology, we mean it in the sort of classical theistic sense, the religious sense of providence, that there is a plan, a goal ordained by something supernatural later, at the end of history, the eschaton or some I ideal that we're meant to live up to, that the future is pulling us forward. Um, no, I, 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 I thoroughly on Spinoza's, on rationalist grounds, on enlightenment grounds, reject, reject the idea of teleology. And I think that teleology actually makes a, a, a sort of bad mysticism of the world right? Because it is not based on understanding structures now and how these structures evolve over time. It is about, uh, well, frankly, an authoritarian faith in a book, a tradition, a document, a cleric, okay, that they have supernatural knowledge that the rest of us don't have. I think there's a lot of problems with teleology in that sense. But on the other hand, if by teleology you mean tendency, then I think there's room for something like teleology. So if by teleology, we mean that based on the way that things are now, there's a tendency for them to move and react and transform in certain ways. Yeah, of course, but that kind of teleology is fully in line with the sort of mechanistic deterministic universe, what, what a Spinozist might call efficient causality. Case in point is uh, Spinoza's idea of the conatus, striving. Okay, so fully metaphysical idea, there is one substance which is self-causing, monism, deus sive natura, God, or in other words, nature, the one impersonal universe, self-causing. Each of us, you and you and you and me, we're all part of this universe. We're modes, modifications of this universe. And since the universe is self-causing, we have a positive existence, a striving. It's basically what I usually describe as like a existential inertia, right? We have a structure and we maintain ourselves unless acted upon by outside forces. It goes for everything, not just us. The ice does not melt on its own accord. Okay, the ice melts because it's acted upon by the rays of the sun, right? Uh, same thing with human beings, and this is why human beings tend to be egoistic, right? And not in, 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 in the non-pejorative sense, that we seek our own satisfaction and increased power and flourishing, unless acted upon by some outside force. Um, and insofar as we have something like a canadus, there is a tendency, okay, um, for us to, um, you know, follow those sort of egoistic imperatives. And I think this can be writ large in society as well. This is why society and uh, economic forms are predictable. It's why the transition from one economic form, let's say feudalism to capitalism, is predictable. You can trace the ways that realities and tensions morph and have tendencies to morph into the next uh, kind of situation. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll address whether Marxism is a type of teleology later. I know I, I, I wanted to add that, but that was unfair. We'll get, we'll get, we'll get to that maybe later. Yeah. Mac, um, in Insurgent Universality, your book, you offer, I think, a quite novel 
uh, critique of teleological forms of thinking on the left. What is your, your thoughts here? I think, uh, again, I like to start with uh, agreement. Uh, we agree that uh, the teleology is not uh, a form of a knowledge of the future. We, uh, I think, uh, I think a teleology, so there are two ways we can address uh, the, the meaning of this word. So I think there is a, what uh, I call the reverse teleology and teleology as a tendency. Uh, let me start with the latter. Uh, teleology as a tendency, I would say yes and no. Uh, why? Because, uh, again, when Marx uh, discusses um, the, the fall of the rate of profit, and, and he describes it as a tendency in the capitalist mode of production, basically, in that chapter, he pays a lot of attention to the counter tendencies. So my point is that uh, what we call tendencies, even the tendency of the fall of the rate of profit is the result of many counter tendencies, which in a certain way have a priority and which bend the tendency. So can we foresee, can we, can we, can we, how can we, how can we work with this uh, huge amount of a counter, counter tendencies? And I think this is uh, where contingency takes place and where we need a, a theory and politics that is able to, to, to work with this a kind of a conjuncture of, of counter tendencies which work uh, in different ways. Uh, so I would say, uh, even, even when we talk about uh, teleology as a tendency, I would say yes and no, as I say, because, uh, because uh, I would give priority to the counter tendencies. Uh, what is a re reverse teleology? Uh, that is the thing I, I criticized, I discussed in my, in my book. It's, a, it's basically is a way to close down uh, uh, past the possibilities. Uh, is, a, is, a, is a way to say, if I, if I, if I use Hegel, or, or not, or, or, or Hegel is a philosopher, let's say, if I use the historian Furet, who describe the terror as a derapage, this is, this is again a kind of a reverse teleology. There are no such a thing as a derapage in history. There are many different trajectories and, and, and which conflict with each other. But in the reverse teleology, uh, what happened is, uh, is that, if I use Hegel for a second, you know, Hegel, Hegel says that uh, the modern idea of freedom began with the Reformation and Martin Luther. In order to say that, he has to exclude another possible practice and understanding of freedom. That was the freedom of the peasants in the peasant war in 1525. That was a Thomas Münzer. That was a, this other trajectory in which freedom was something else. And, 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 and what Hegel has to do in order to, to, to find a kind of a continuity in terms of a progress and development, he has to cut off all these other trajectories uh, and deviations. For that reason, I disagree with the statement that uh, uh, the, the, the transition or, or, or the, yeah, from, from feudalism to capitalism is a kind of a, predictable, uh, it's not. It happened. In my view, it happened. What uh, Thomas Münzer and the peasants were doing, they were, much more than Luther, they were using Middle Ages and medieval institutions and traditions and customary laws and so on as a weapon against private property and the centralization of power in the hands of the new state. So. This, this Middle Ages stuff is a kind of an arsenal that can lead to something else than private property and state. This is not something I invent. It happened in the German peasant wars. It happened uh, in the commune. The communards were not afraid to use the imperative mandate 
and to refer to the uh, freedom of the cities in Middle Ages and try to take them back. So it means that uh, there is another way to see and to map the past that considers the past as an open arsenal. But this is possible if we break teleology and we can see that the past as a, something that is open to different possibilities. I think that today we can and we should learn how to use these possibilities and we should learn from real practices. I think in this way, I, my work is a kind of a humble, very humble work. What I'm saying is I'm learning how to do that from the German peasants, the communists, the Sanculos, all these people who, 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 who played with the past in a way that the past is not past, but is, a, is, a, is an arsenal of possibilities. If I could just ask a question, right? I mean, there's a, there's a pretty striking statement that uh, the transition from feudalism to capitalism wasn't uh, predictable in some kind of causal way, but I think the, the phrase you used is it, it happened or it just happened um, because of certain people taking advantage or not taking advantage of certain uh, open possibilities. Uh, Max, I, I don't want to mischaracterize what you said. Is that is that part of what you said, or I would say what I said is uh, uh, again. No, let's uh, stick on Marx. Yeah. So if I read if I read Marx on the, on the original accumulation, uh, what you see is that uh, the beginning, the origin of a, of a, of a capitalism, is what is the result of uh, many different things. Enclosures, the state, financial market, and so on. And all these things, all these uh, trajectories combined in a certain way. And that is what we call capitalism. So it happened because of a kind of a conjuncture of a, of a combination of a, all these different dimensions. Okay. And then my point is, when that happened, there was a there was a war, there was a struggle, there was a tension between different trajectories. So Middle Ages could have gone in the direction of Thomas Minzer. It didn't. Why? Because the Thomas Minzer was massacred, and the peasants were massacred. So it could have gone in that direction. I don't write history with the if. I'm saying they gave us an image of different institutions and legalities which were in place for a few years. And that was a, a different outcome of the Middle Ages. So what I'm saying is only they, there is not one unique outcome from Middle Ages. There were many. But so, it meant that one won the battle so, and, so I, uh, and, yeah. and they massacred the alternatives. But, but I find this to be a, a extremely uh, fascinating metaphysical statement on your part, right? Because, uh, well, it is, right? Because you're 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 you know very explicitly saying that, uh, well, you're saying an an indeterminist thing. You're saying that uh, it could have been otherwise multiple times now, right? And so, look, uh, no no uh, card carrying determinist would deny, myself included that uh, for any historical event, there is not one cause, but there is a conjunction of many causes. Of course, yes, we live in a complex world. There are individual personalities. There's the material substrate. There's politics and geopolitical and, hell, environmental concerns uh, and factors as well. Yep, beyond, beyond dispute. Um, well, but the metaphysical question that I want to ask is like, um, did it happen, okay, to take the example of um, the, the eventual triumph of capitalism in Europe following feudalism, the, the massacre of Munzer and the triumph of capitalism. Did that happen for some reason or no reason? Right? I mean, it's like, those are, those are two stark models, right? Either it happened for some reason, and I would pluralize it, some reasons. Okay, the massacre of Munzer, the ideas between people's ears, uh, material factors, because, you know, perhaps there wasn't the proper economic base for anything else. Um, either it happened for a collectivity of reasons, and therefore, uh, although we can maybe take inspiration from certain images or events, okay, it, it happened and so it had to happen. That's what I would say. Uh, 
And therefore, with enough predictive ability, it was predictable. Uh, or it literally happened for no reason. Or at least that there's an element of sort of secret sauce, right? That there were a lot of factors, but ah, it could have actually broken uh, in any number of ways. And and then, but look, then you're committed to the idea that it could have broken any number of ways for no for no reason. I mean, is that is that what you're committing to? A sort of strong indeterminism. One one quick intervention, if I might, yeah. as moderator. I really like where this is headed. Mm -hmm. I think we're, we're we're arriving at some nice points of contrast here. Yeah. Like, as I understand it, to summarize Max's position, having read the introduction to Insurgent Universality, uh, there seems to be a sort of insurgent or subterranean expression of universalism, which is uh, which appears uh, not necessarily in um the the thought of a master thinker such as kant hegel or spinoza but appears on the periphery in moments of uprising and struggle which go to define these excess moments go to define uh or or rather manifest a certain type of universalism i think that is somewhat of a good summary of your position max but now i now landon is challenging to understand um, how determination is thought of within this framework and whether history is pure contingency with so, no determination. So just to sharpen my question then in one sentence, I get, I, I get that that's the thesis. My question as a determinist is amongst those people who have those revolutionary ideas, did those ideas come from somewhere or nowhere? Were they merely chosen? or were they in some sense caused? And secondly, did those ideas that people had at that time have or not have an impact or a decisive impact for some reason or for no reason? Was there a cause? So to sharpen my question, that's the question. I think, uh, you know, what the... What I like to do when I, I if I look at, so we are talking about the kind of a possible exit from, from the so-called Middle Ages or feudalism. And if I go back to the 1525 Peasants' War and Thomas Minza, I would say my first statement is that uh, uh, at that time there was a tension, a tension between, uh, that is the war, between uh, incompatible trajectories, incompatible legal systems, incompatible practices of uh, property, and so on. And uh, I emphasize the term incompatible because uh, because uh, probably we agree on that. Because uh, because uh, my position is not uh, relativistic in the sense that uh, oh, I want to multiply temporalities and trajectories and uh, I want to keep them open and no, no, I, I focus on tensions between incompatible trajectories. Incompatibility means that uh, they cannot coexist. Centralization of the state, princes and uh, all the authority that uh, basically uh, uh, Luther uh, glorified uh, is incompatible with the uh, practice of the peasants. And the decentralization of a sovereignty is incompatible with the self, local self-government, is incompatible with the common forms of a possession. And so on. the two things are the two trajectories are incompatible. Now, my point is that uh, first, uh, what we call the dominant reformation, Luther, what uh, Hegel is talking about, I would say. Uh, if I focus on this attention, I would call Luther and the dominant reformation as a kind of a reaction against uh, that war. So the reformation took shape as a, as, a, as a weapon to close down the possibility that the peasants open up is a, is a reaction. And you can, if you follow what happened at the time, they it, it was a kind of a, one-to-one 
a, a fight about uh, interpretation of, uh, of, uh, of passages of the gospel, passages of, uh, of Paul. Winsor and, and Luther, they read uh, uh, Romans 13 in the opposite way. Uh, um, so the, the point is, uh, the point is uh, to what extent this uh, individualization, interiorization of the consciousness uh, of the salvation in Luther is actually a gigantic weapon to neutralize the eschatological dimension that allowed the peasants to rebel. So, so I think, uh, I think, uh, I think, uh, you know, my, 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 my point is uh, to, to, to show that uh, in history, so basically in, in one word, otherwise I take too much time. I think, I think a theory needs a lot of history, needs more and more history. I think this is my understanding. This is what the Marx have done, has done. So theory needs history and theory needs to, to be able and capable to extract theories and categories from history again. Because, uh, because, uh, because, uh, because uh, in these events that I call insurgent events, we can see possibilities. We can see different ways in which political life can be, can be organized uh, and so on. So my, my statement is, uh, is uh, we should be able to address these events and their insurgents as a kind of a theorist in action and their practice as a theory in action. This is the kind of a turning point. This is the this is the My Copernican revolution. Is a see let's learn theory from practices. That that's very helpful. That draws me to an important question that I think is implicit in this debate which is the role of the theorist uh, and the philosopher in the project of socialist politics and emancipatory politics. Um, let me start with Landon. In your vision, Landon, how are the ideas of universal emancipation to be transmitted? And is there a duty for a socialist or Marxist intellectual in that process? Because I do sense from Max perhaps an important difference there. But we'll hear first from Landon and then from Max. So, all right, thanks. So, so the question is, how are the ideas of the, the radical enlightenment or, or monism to be imparted? That's, that's good, yes, exactly, exactly. Yeah, I mean, look, uh, on the one hand, I think it's just uh, you know, a fact of life that some people spend more time doing theory than others. Some people are temperamentally more interested in theory than others. Some people have uh, full-time uh, academic positions and are lucky enough to do that if they consider themselves lucky to think about theory, write about theory, write in popular venues. And other people don't have that desire or don't have that luxury. Um, on the other hand, uh, I don't think that philosophy is some kind of, uh, that philosophy as such is some kind of rarefied thing. Um, I hope if I've uh, not expressed myself too poorly today, I've communicated the idea that I think um, philosophy is precisely not about digging up this or that particular tradition, let alone having uh, just sort of, uh, you know, a banner philosopher, a toy philosopher that you like to try it out again and again at conferences. No, uh, philosophy is about the world. It is about changing the world, uh, as Marx said, not merely interpreting it. But in order to change it, you have to understand it. You have to understand something of human nature and the human good. Um, so in that sense, everyone is a lay philosopher. I would put it like that. Uh, absolutely everyone. Insofar as you are acting in the world and making decisions, insofar as you are even minimally self-critical and self-reflective, and I think more people are than we give them credit for, um, everyone is, uh, you know, something like a philosopher, because you are at least implicitly justifying your actions, your life decisions to yourself. And the point of the um, professional philosopher and the professional theorist is to paraphrase Marx, um, not to tell people not to struggle or tell them that their struggles are necessarily wrong, but to uh, show them why they are struggling, 
for what they are struggling. Um, that's not always a sort of uncritical affirmation. Okay, so so likewise, Spinoza's famous quote on this is uh, is a question. He asked, um, "Why do men fight for their servitude as stubbornly as though it were for their salvation?" In other words, why do slaves fight for their masters? Um, there are, you know, as much as everyone is a sort of amateur philosopher, there are a lot of people struggling out there who are struggling for things which are objectively bad, um, and they have confused ideas. And they're fighting against their own interests. And, you know, just wait for the next general election in the U.S., okay? It'll be on prime time and Twitter every day, okay? And and so I think it's the the proper role, the duty of the a philosopher, insofar as one is the luxury to be one, um, to actually make arguments and justifications, to make, um, you know, to, to not just simply uh, relate back to sort of mis- possibilities and open avenues from the past, okay, because how do you know which are the good ones, right? Uh, actually, it's to make uh, objective, defensible, justifiable claims now about um, the way that the economy, the way that politics, the way that reality is organized presently, make arguments now in plain language, and I emphasize this in all of my classes, in plain language, that people can actually understand um, the nature of the human good and human nature, uh, the nature of the good life, and therefore make a justifiable argument why we should and how we can get from here to there, get from here to something like success. Um, that's the that's the role, as far as I can tell, of the of the theorist. Max, how would you address the role of the theorist? Yeah, I think uh, you you provoke my pessimism now. Um, I I so let's say okay, what is the role of a, of a, of a theory in uh, in the in the transmission of uh, ideas of uh, emancipation? This is how I understood your question, and uh, and I would say you know I like. You know the term. The term transmission is is a for kind of a tra- tradition of a, of ideas of emancipation. I think the term transition, uh, transmission. Sorry, is 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 very appropriated because uh, so it it reminds me. You know, the the in German the same word Überlieferung means uh, tradition, legacy, but also transmission, passing on. Uh, now, now the point. My point is uh, that is a transmission as broken, and this is my pessimism. It's broken. Why? Because uh, because the the big institutions, collective institutions, which were the kind of uh, objectified traditions, the embodiment of this uh, tradition and continuity. They have been destroyed. They have been smashed. And uh, and what is left? We can also go in another direction. What uh, what what is a memory today? When when memory is a kind of a gigantic arsenal of information in Wikipedia, and uh, and uh, and the memory is uh, is uh, no longer a kind of a living memory. Experience the memory is uh, something objectified. So as I say, you provoke my pessimism, and uh, and my pessimism goes even into the direction that I think: uh, uh, what can we do as a theorist? Very, very little. We can write a book. A book doesn't replace the big institutions, collective institutions. A book, our books, academic books. When we are lucky, we have a uh, seventy-five readers. And uh, we, when we are super lucky, we have a discussion like this. Uh, but uh, they don't replace the transmission of uh, ideas of emancipation and the, and the big institutions. What I try to do now in order to defeat my pessimism is, uh, as I said, I try to, to turn my, my view in another direction. 
And, uh, and what I do and what I teach, what I try to do with my students uh, when I can is, uh, you know, what if uh, we start reading uh, all these, uh, this is what I've done in, in Surgeon Universality. If we start reading manifestos, declarations, all these uh, texts written by the insurgents as a, as a theory, as a, in, and we, as, and, uh, what if uh, we take these uh, texts and we read them seriously as we read Hegel and Spinoza and we comment on that text philologically with the same, and we pay the same attention to them as a form of a theory in action. I think this can be a way to, not just to, to resuscitate this text for the, for the gigantic archive that we are building, but to see the kind of a life in this text and to see that the theory is, a, is actually everywhere. Theory is not only in the academy. Theory is not only in the head of uh, uh, Max Tomba. Uh, uh, theory is uh, in the practice of uh, all these uh, insurgents who brought manifestos, declarations, and, uh, and so on. But we have to learn how to read this text. Because otherwise, yes, it's very easy to show students that uh, if you compare John Locke and Will Stanley, Will Stanley looks naive. It's full of citation of the Bible and is a way of reasoning is not what has become the dominant canon. So for that reason, it looks naive, but it's not a naive. It's an alternative wave of thinking, an alternative wave of a practicing reason, if you want. So, and, 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 and this is what I want to teach uh, uh, my students. I, I hope it's enough, but is this, uh, is this what I can do? I want to pivot to and encourage you to be brief in your response to elucidate your positions with more clarity. Could you give a quick definition of how you understand Marx's concept of the proletariat? Uh, since Max just went, we'll start with Landon. I, I think that the, the proletariat, the modern working class, is an important um, concept in Marx, not only because the struggle, the class struggle of the proletariat has a lot of explanatory power, okay, that the material struggle for um, emancipation from exploitation and alienation explains a lot of other things in terms of other struggles, okay, so anti-imperial and anti-colonial struggles, racial struggles, struggles for sexual and gender equality, but also because, as I mentioned earlier, the proletariat is identified as the universal class. It is not simply one identity and one uh, set of traditions, one set of vocabularies among others, but that the struggle of the proletariat, the struggle of the modern working class contains within itself the seeds of a future truly universal classless society, free of exploitation and alienation. Full stop. Thank you very much. And Max, how would you answer this question? I think I think I I I I I I think I basically I basically agree. I would I would add that for me, uh, again, if I go back to Marx, uh, Marx uh, defines the position of the of the proletarians in terms of a uh, uh, absolute injustice. Das Unrecht schlecht in. I think uh, uh, this definition always struck me because. Uh, is, is the kind of absoluteness of this injustice. Uh, I think that defines the position of the proletarians. I think it would be interesting to have a, a long conversation about why this injustice is not one injustice among many, but is the injustice, the absolute injustice. On the other, on the other hand, calling this thing injustice opens up a question about uh, a just world, and this is what we are fighting for: is uh, is the possibility of a transformation and how we change the world. I, I am aware that uh, now my position and London's position will diverge because, uh, to me, justice is a kind of a is the openness. Is the, justice is uh, is uh, is an experiment. The best we can do is. Uh, 
we should experiment with the justice. And we will have a many different experiments, and we have a past experiments, present experiments, future experiments, but we will not, and I would say thanks I God, uh, uh, we cannot, we can, we can, we can, we cannot uh, realize justice. We cannot realize a world that is a perfectly just. I think we have to live as a human with the with the openness of these experiments. If I could just briefly, because I think this is a a useful divergence to highlight. Um, <clears throat> to be clear, I'm not against. Uh, experiments in new kinds of living. I'm not against uh, experiments in trying to achieve um, better kinds of societies, more just societies. We are finite embodied creatures and this is a necessity. Um, my concern, Max, is that uh, without a metaphysics, without an idea of human nature and a stable sort of measuring stick of what human flourishing looks like, it's not that you're merely uh, 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 recommending experiments, but that you don't have a way of judging the relative success of those experiments. You see, that's that's the specific divergence. I think that yes, we we will never maybe get it perfectly correct, but at least there's some standard which is justifiable, which I think that I can justify as against my political enemies, as against their standard, which I think if they are, uh, you know, let's say pro-capitalist or racist, misogynistic, anti-trans, I think that their standard is not justifiable, that my enemies are wrong and I am right. And therefore, whether my experiment works better than theirs is something that I can ultimately determine. And, uh, you know, with respect, I don't, I haven't yet uh, heard what that measuring stick could be. And, and, and furthermore, my supposition is that if for you, human nature is nothing over and above the sort of risky political struggle, uh, that there even in principle could be such a measuring stick of success for these experiments. Okay, I think uh, Max, you can quickly respond if you wish, or, yeah. or I can move on to my next question. Yeah, yeah I think I think it's, it's, I think this is the starting point for a, for a new conversation. I think I think. Uh, I think uh, Yes, how, how, how do we judge experiments? It's true. I think I have a, I have a, I think I work with a very, very thin normativity. Uh, 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 and, and, and I would say an experiment, an experiment that accepts its own incompleteness and openness can be basically acceptable. What is unacceptable is an experiment that represents itself as a totality, as a, as a, as a, because a totality excludes something else. So a fascist experiment, to be clear, is unacceptable because it's based on the exclusion of other experiments. I'm not a liberal pluralist. I'm saying that uh, uh, we need some basic criteria to define which kind of experiment is acceptable in a way that, in, you know, in a, my, this is my reading and understanding of the Zapatista's motto uh, 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 about one world in which many worlds can fit. So we, we so the one world, again, very often people just emphasize the second part, oh, the plurality, many worlds. No, for, to me, what is really important is the one world. So we are not so distant. I, I am not, a, I'm not a, an, an enemy of the oneness. The oneness of this one world is, the, and this is the divergence, is the open possibility. And we have to keep open this possibility and we have to build uh, criteria in order to, to define case by case what is acceptable, what is not. Um, yeah. But but to what if I could why why then uh, are you in favor of one world? Like I just haven't heard a justification for this. In fact, I would say that uh, your uh, rejection because I read your chapters, your rejection of isms and your rejection of exclusion seems to also thereby a, be a de facto rejection of criteria. Criteria by their nature exclude, and so you say a, a fascist experiment excludes other worlds. I would like to exclude the fascist. Um, What's 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 wrong with that? I uh, you would like to exclude the fashion. Now I see the point. Yeah. <laughs> 
I, I, I would say, <laughs> yes, as I say, a fascist experiment is unacceptable and can be excluded because, uh, because uh, it's, it's grounded on the exclusion of, of the other experiment. So in a certain way, it's the exclusion of the exclusion. But, 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 uh, but I think, I think what, is, what is more interesting to me is, uh, is uh, why, from different perspectives, we are both saying that we want to do something with this uh, oneness, with this uh, one. And uh, and from my perspective, the one, because you mentioned this thing many times, is uh, is the human nature. The difference is that uh, uh, the you even human nature is an experiment. So this is my uh, 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 blockianism, Ernst Bloch. So what we are doing is an experiment with ourselves and with the world. Is an experiment with the justice. And uh, and uh, and I think what is a unique and this is something that I I I, I really value, and probably we agree. Uh, or, so it's it's what is a unique of a humans is that we question our world and the justice and the injustice in which we live. We don't just fight back because of something happened to us. We don't just react because uh, something happened to us. We question the justice of our social relations, and uh, and 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 for that reason, there is something unique in humans that is uh, the way they all the time make demand on justice, on fairness of something that is uh, different and uh, can change our 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 social relations this is only only humans do this thing we we can change our relations we can change the world in which we live because we have this uh, force of uh, questioning the basic assumption of our society we don't reproduce the same scheme over and over and, and I think we have to deal with that and we have to learn how to, to use this force in a way that doesn't destroy others, the environment, the nature and everything. Because it is, a, is, a, is, a, is an, an extremely powerful force that is basically grounded in a, what, what, you, what you can call rationality, what I would call is, a, is grounded in our capability to produce abstractions. And, and this is what we are, and we have to deal with that. Hmm. Landon, I'm, I'm sure you're dying for a response, but let me turn to a question which I think will help give more uh, sure. perspective to the listener. The early Marx, in a letter to a left Hegelian, once wrote the following statement. I'm going to read it. I've shared it with both of you beforehand for you to think about it. And I want you to perhaps reflect and share your perspective as to what Marx really means about um, really to going back to this notion of first principles as Marxists is what he's talking about. He says, quote, we shall confront the world not as doctrinaires with a new principle, such as we say, here is the truth, bow down before it, exclamation point. We develop new principles to the world out of its own principles. We do not say to the world, stop fighting, your struggle is of no account. We want to shout the true slogan of the struggle at you. We only show the world what it is fighting for. Let us start with Landon for your reading and your interpretation of this statement from Marx. <clears throat> yeah. Um... As with a lot of Marx quotes, can be taken in sort of radically different directions. Um, it 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 appears uh, to be at the front end almost uh, an anti-intellectualist statement, right? He's sarcastically saying, uh, "We're not going to say here is the truth, bow down before it." Um, and instead, what philosophy is meant to do, or what so Marxist theory is meant to do, is to 
uh, draw out of the actual confrontations of the world, the actual struggles as they are, um, you know, principles. Um, but the last sentence sort of puts page to that notion. We want to shout the true slogan of the struggle at you. Um, you know, and and we and and but rather we only want to show the world what it is fighting for. So there are competing notions of truth here. Okay, on the one hand, Marx is sarcastically denigrating the idea that there is a true slogan, a true philosophy which hovers above the world. On the other hand, he's clearly not being a relativist, right? He's saying that, uh, but the actual truth is a sort of theoretical reflection. You know, Engels does this too, an anti during um, amongst other places, right? Um, and, and in dialectics, right? It's like the truth, okay, as theoretically understood, is a sort of intellectual reflex, a reaction against what actually is. So he's not throwing out the truth as such. He's only throwing out a sort of um, deracinated, non-material notion of the truth that hovers above things. Um, and I think that this is really important with reference to what uh, Max just said in the previous question, which is his idea of uh, human nature, though I would maybe take issue that it is called human nature. I think that, uh, you know, you know, in, in the Nicomachean Ethics, okay, to put a sharp point on it, Aristotle said that there's one way to be right and many ways to go wrong. Uh, I disagree. I think that there is uh, one way to be right. Spinoza got 90% of the way there, but basically something like the, the radical enlightenment tradition of the enlightenment, okay, uh, objective natures, objective human nature, an objective notion of the good, okay? And there is, if we're going to be logically consistent, one diametrically opposed position to that. Okay, there, you know, most people are in between, but the diametrically opposed position, the logical opposite of that, the sort of polar opposite, is an emphasis on the free creative will, okay? So the world is either sustained by objective truth or by creative and, and thereby also destructive wills. Um, and I think in reading, you know, several hundred pages from Max, I really think that uh, the logical implication is that he's in that second camp. Okay, that if politics is nothing more than the excess of the constitution represent democracy, but also the excess of any stable human essence or human nature, if politics really is this sort of um, creative activity, and that's what struggle is for him, therefore, a sort of creative free activity of the will. Um, my worry is that not only is it unmoored, okay, from an objective standard of what success might mean, that's what I said in the last question, but my worry is that it doesn't even sustain the sort of inclusive uh, multiverse that Max seems to want to propose, uh, for example, when referencing the Zapatista idea of many worlds combined into one world, or at least uh, in tension with one another in one world. Uh, wills, unhinged from reason, okay, unhinged from an objective intellect which mirrors an objectively intelligible world. Free wills do not play nicely with one another by their very nature, right? A, a will which is absolutely creative is its own world, its own universe unto itself. And uh, there is no putting them back into the box. This is what uh, Leo Strauss said in Social Science and Humanism, that one cannot have one's cake and eat it too, uh, that there is a fundamental incompatibility for my existential commitment, something that pertains to the will, and my sympathetic understanding, something that can, um, pertains to human reason and solidarity. Uh, if there is no objective basis for solidarity, there is no reason to think that solidarity will obtain, will occur. And uh, instead, uh, a real politics, okay, which, which, which I do not affirm, but a real politics, which is uh, unhinged from... Uh, justifiable moral metaphysical considerations will be a contest of wills, will not be something that can play together in this sort of, you know, Zapatista-esque schema that was uh, uh, promoted. And so with reference to Marx, you know, yes, uh, we need to uh, sort of elucidate what the struggle is, but the only way that you can elucidate what the actual real material struggle is, is by presuming uh, that this struggle is something objective, it is something structural, it is something that pertains to an intelligible human good and human flourishing. Okay, very good. Max, please respond. Okay, I think 
I think since we are approach we are approaching the end of this debate, I think it's time to make a a, a dramatic statement about the difference of our approaches. Uh, I would say we we move from two different traditions in within the Enlightenment. And, uh, and as I said before, to me is a how we can use both. But in any case, let's, uh, let's uh, play with the, the divergence. So to me, reason, and then I go back to the, the Marx citation. So reason leads to antinomies. So now it's very clear that uh, I, I sided with, uh, with Kant. Uh, what does it mean that the reason leads to uh, antinomies? For example, uh, in, the, in the third the antinomy of the pure reason and in the critique of the pure reason, so Kant uh, discusses the, the, the two alternatives. So the, the world has a, an absolute beginning or because of this a chain of a cause effect, we have an infinite regression and the world doesn't have an absolute beginning. What Kant is talking about is a freedom. How can we understand the freedom? Is a freedom always in this a chain of a cause effect or freedom is an absolute beginning? Now, I think what is interesting, and this is where I, I am a Kantian, uh, there is no theoretical solution to the antinomy in Kant. There is a practical solution to the antinomy, but not theoretical. So if, for Kant, then we have to move to the practical reason and we can say, look, it's possible to think without contradiction that uh, an absolute beginning is possible. That means that uh, I can think of myself as a free agent and that is called the spontaneity. And, uh, and we have to deal with that. It, it doesn't mean that I know that I am a spontaneous human being. It doesn't mean that I know that I'm acting as a free agent. It means that it's possible. This is my reading of Kant. Now is okay, let's play with this possibility. And that possibility has a, something to do with the, with the tensions, with the struggles. Is a, is possible, but at the same time, I am finite, I am a human being, I am uh, conditioned by so many different things that I don't know if I can do it. But I know that I am always in this uh, kind of a struggle. What I'm doing is I try to, now I'm no longer a Kantian, I try to expand this idea of a struggle that is possible because of the antinomies into Marx's citation, we only show the world what is fighting for. The world is a fighting for freedom and justice. And we have to point out all these events in which these fights take place and show them as a possibilities, as, a, as our kind of a universality in action something that we, we can and we should embrace in order to go in another direction. And, but that happens at the pra practical level and that happens at the uh, historical level. So we have to dig in this historical material, make our hands a little bit dirty and, uh, and try to extract uh, 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 normativity from practices. If I could just very briefly, because that was extremely revealing. So th thank you. Thank you for showing your <laughs> Kantianism ID card, because I think it just it, it will just clarifies things. It's a more honest discussion, which I appreciate. Um, and look, yeah, you're right. You're right. You're absolutely right. Th this is the this is the fundamental difference. I believe in a fully intelligible world, uh, you know, if not a fully good world, certainly, but a fully intelligible world. You believe that there are these irresolvable antinomies and you correctly say that the there is no resolution to them, but therefore we must fall back on, well, what Kant might call regulative ideas, what you could call practical solutions. What Spinoza says about this in his early work on method, the emendations, is that, well, look, these are these kinds of things are rules, okay? It's not a certainly true idea 
It's a rule. And the problem with rules is that rules are not self justifying. Rules require other rules, tertiary, secondary, tertiary rules to justify the primary and secondary rules, respectively. And uh, ultimately, it's an infinite regress. And so what ends up being a practical solution, to my mind, ends up in, well, that dirty American word, that dirty American philosophy, pragmatism. Because if the, if the rules are not self-justifying, if they're not based on a certainly true idea, if they're not based on a coherent metaphysics, they are simply rules on rules on rules on rules. It's what you want. It's what's needed. It's what's necessary, as you keep saying in your writing. And uh, I understand you're not a liberal pluralist. I, I believe you. I'm not here to gainsay that. But what I don't understand is why you're not, why you're not, why, why you're not, I, I believe you, you're a good person, but why aren't you Richard Rorty, right? So Richard Rorty also believes that there is no non-question begging way to interpret the universe. He believes in the figure called the liberal ironist, that the worst thing we can do is cruelty, but that there's no reason to believe that that is absolutely true in a non-question begging way. In fact, in uh, Contingency, Irony, and Solidarity, I believe it's called, he said, uh, of course, he's an anti-racist and an anti-fascist, but that there is no ultimately non-questioning begging reason not to be a Nazi. So back to Ma Ma uh, Marx's quote, show the world what it's fighting for. Yeah, very good. Which people? What fight? Do you have a reason? So do you have a non-question begging reason not to show the fascist what they're fighting for, or is it just is it, is it just your tradition? And and by the way, if, if it is simply your tradition, well, I'm afraid we have something like the Euthyphro problem, which is to say, is your tradition good because it's right, or do you follow that tradition? You know, do you follow it because it's objectively right, uh, or do you just call those things right because they are yours? What Leo Strauss and Hobbes would say, uh, homebred and prescriptive. May I, one second? Um, Please. And then we will have a, an episode or two sooner or later. <laughs> now, I think, I think, I think, so I think my, biographically, if you want, or psychologically, my pluralism is grounded on the fact that we, as I said many times, we, 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 we live in a time in which uh, the kind of a compass that was provided by a, a working class tradition and institutions, uh, this compass has broken, has been destroyed, and uh, and 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 what what is left is very is a is a is a mess. Is a, and and I can see your effort to put together the mess and to try to give sense and order and and the meaning to this messy time. And uh, and monism can be can be a way out, uh, and I respect that. Uh, my way out is a is a is a kind of a maybe I don't know epistemic normativity. So what I'm doing is uh, uh, I look this is a chapter in my new book. I look at the Cochabamba water war, and I say, oh look, they break the binary private property, national property, state property, and they are working with this idea of a social property. I say, look, this is the thing. This is the epistemic normativity. This is a guideline. This is where we can go. It's another way of a practicing property that can be take, can be taken as a as a as a as a as a category that is worthy to be thought as a category. So in a certain way, I'm trying to uh, look at these different events and, and extract the categories, which can, which can allow us to put together the compass we need, orientations and so on. Uh, yeah, I think this is, uh, this, is my, this is what I'm doing. This is where I am now. Two questions, and then we will uh, conclude. This has been such a, a informative and, and interesting conversation. Uh, I want to thank you both for joining me. Of course, two thank questions. You. One, one to Landon first. Um, some have uh, critiqued uh, or or cast suspicion on the idea that first principles and a priori understanding of reason 
in political activity risks falling into idealism. I want you to respond to that and I'll, uh, why it does not for you. I'm assuming that you don't want to be accused of being an idealist. And secondly, we know that Henry Kissinger was uh, fond of Spinoza. So how do you fortify monism from reactionary co-optation? Sure. Um, <clears throat> let me let me deal with the second one first because it's more concrete. Um, Henry Kissinger was a war criminal um, from uh, evidence of blood on his hands from Cambodia to, to Bangladesh to East Timor. Uh, and, and war criminals like anyone else are able to invoke any number of uh, schools of thought or historical figures uh, as a fig leaf for their crimes. Um, <clears throat> how do you avoid being co-opted? I think one of the primary ways you avoid being co-opted is by using plain language. I think it is a, a serious misstep on the part of people doing professional philosophy in the university setting to, uh, you know, have their favorite philosophers as sort of uh, banners, as cudgels. It's like, it's, like, it's like the equivalent of like, you know, Bible beating instead of reading the Bible. People do that with philosophy too, that they just have their traditions that they die on a hill for. And, um, and that's a problem because then they become floating signifiers. You know, Spinoza could mean all sorts of different things uh, from universal solidarity and emancipation as I read him to a sort of real politic as Kissinger might. So instead of talking about um, proper names, I think what we need to do is talk about actual concepts, right? And so, and so uh, that's why uh, in all of my classes, I read philosophers for their arguments, for their arguments as they're applicable to the real world. So if Spinoza makes an argument, okay, that we are all part of one uh, monistic universe, we are all modifications of the same, and um, therefore that uh, we have a substantial unity with one another, okay, then uh, this leads to a sort of um, extremely demanding ethics and political solidarity. Uh, you know, I, I often joke sarcastically that like Spinoza does like one better than Jesus, right? Like Jesus says, like, love your neighbor and even your enemy as yourself. And Spinoza agrees, but goes one step further and says like, no, love them because they are yourself. You're not speaking truth to power. You're not counterbalancing ethical identification with personal sort of real politic urges. You are uh, identifying the two, that your egoism, your desire to thrive and survive is identical to uh, that same conatus, that same striving in others, even those who share no particular cultural, linguistic, geographic background to you. <clears throat> when you state it plain like that, it's very hard to be co-opted by someone uh, uh, the likes of Henry Kissinger because it simply grates against everything they uh, actually believe in and actually do in the world. And um, with reference to materialism and idealism, I'll just briefly say this. Uh, these have also become floating signifiers. No one knows what they're talking about anymore. When they use the words materialism and idealism, they're used as a cudgel, just like proper names are. Uh, I, I would say this about materialism and idealism. Um, often people who want to argue against idealism for a kind of uh, freed up materialism, argue that there should not be considerations like uh, natural intelligible laws governing the material universe. They want matter to sort of do its own thing. And, and they think that thereby they've escaped being idealists. No, wrong, to the contrary. I think that when you get rid of the intelligible strictures of the universe, what Spinoza might call the immediate infinite modes, okay? Uh, but in any case, what we can in plain language just called natural laws. When we get rid of these intelligible strictures for how matter is and how matter can work, what you end up is uh, a sort of bad Heraclitean flux, a disintegrated super universe. And if you have a disintegrated super universe, well, you either just shrug your shoulders and give up and go home. That's one option. You become a mystic, perhaps. You become a hermit. Or you want to intervene in the world still. And so you emphasize the will. You emphasize practical solutions, regulative ideas. You emphasize the strong uh, heroic poet, for example, uh, as, as Rorty might. Someone to cohere the world again. Okay. And uh, well, guess what? That's the worst kind of idealism on offer. 
It's an idealism which basically says, because we are such free materialists, free of the intellect, but we want to intervene in the world, there must be a master intellect, a master idea, freely chosen, though, to bring it all back together. Uh, if you want to avoid idealism and materialism, you should be an absolute idealist in the tradition of Spinoza through Hegel. You should believe that uh, that intelligence and intelligible strictures are uh, inherent in matter itself, not a regulative idea that hovers above it like a ghost. Very well said. Thank you very much. Final question. Final question, please. Um, this uh, conversation is extremely elucidating. I'm, I'm sure that, that my listeners are going to get a lot out of it. What might you say for how we might bring in um, non-philosophers, non-academicians, um, working class people, um, people experiencing oppression, subalterns, et cetera, et cetera, into this conversation? Um, have you put any thought to how um, ideas might um, skip out of these silos. And I, I mean, obviously, we're doing this on a para academic podcast right now. So that's maybe a start. But are there other ideas that you have about how we can um, reach more people and bring people in on the left to these debates, to these discussions? Let's start with uh, Max. Okay. Uh, I try to be extremely brief. And one thing, so the first thing I want to say is I, 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 I need to do it, is I want to go back to something that uh, uh, London said before. I think there is another way to, to, to read uh, love your neighbor or, 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 or your brother or in poor is a, even use the term the other hetero so it's not the same is is the the challenge is how you love the hetero the other so and i think uh, i think especially in paul and the in the in the, in the in the long tradition before the reformation that individualized everything basically uh, this love is not uh, an individualistic sentimental modern love is not is a is a political principle in a certain way because uh, because this love means that uh, you have to change the world in a way in which the love of your uh, of a, of the other that you didn't choose is possible. It's very easy to love people you choose. It's uh, very easy to love your friends because. Uh, you choose that. And then you go into the kind of a friend's enemy opposition. The point is how is possible to live in a world in which you love people you didn't choose? And that has that requires an active transformation of our social uh, uh, circumstances. So I would say there is a way even to read a love as a political principle. Uh, to your question, uh, Maybe maybe this is a starting point. You know, let's let's read what a, a large majority of this population and my population in Italy do. Let's just try to comment on these texts in a different way, in a different direction. Let's talk that that happened in my experience when I was in Italy. Let's talk about a, a, a daily experience of a, of a, of a working class of people. And why are they so angry and dissatisfied? And uh, so it happened to me, and then I stopped with a very short anecdote. I was uh, I was invited. I was in it was in Italy. It was thirty years ago. I was invited to give a talk uh, in a for for a union, and there was a kind of a working class audience. I started reading and commenting on Marx on factory, and one worker said, "Oh wow." Now, an academic from Padua at the time was working in Padua, finally is telling us what is our experience, whereas the unionists don't understand it. I think this is a way 
to, 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 to engage a dialogue when we start talking about the, the daily experience of uh, having your body destroyed because of the work you are doing and, and, and these kind of things. I think we have to go back to immediate experience and the daily experience and, and find the language for that. Landon, please. Yeah, I mean, I, <clears throat> I think when we're talking about getting beyond the university campus, it's about it's about going back to Socrates, really. It's about uh, being the gadfly and not the lecturer. Um, and, you know, frankly, I do this in my classes a lot too, right? So my culminating assignment for my Enlightenment class, early modern class, is uh, very evil. I have them write uh, <clears throat> an essay in geometric form. And there's like several stages of grief that go along with this. So the first stage is, oh, good, it's three pages instead of 15. Fantastic. Uh, oh, good, it's open topic. Uh, I only ask them to argue for anything they believe in. Uh, but like Spinoza in his magnum opus, The Ethics, I make them rigorously defend it di uh, deductively from uh, definitions and first principles and numbered propositions, okay, one through whatever, 15, 20. And they have a disputation with me. And I say, all right, look, there better not be any hanging propositions. I need to see that everything is deduced. And then the third stage of grief is they actually sit down and do it too late and they find it so difficult to actually defend things they believe in, which they always knew they believed in, which they always knew they were absolutely cocksure about. But now all of a sudden, when I say the assignment is prove it deductively to someone who would stridently disagree with you, then it becomes a crisis. And I get dozens of phone calls and emails within the last 48 hours. It's hilarious. And I love it. And I do it every... And then at the end, they say, this is you know, the hardest thing I've ever done, but it's, it's great. And I say, fantastic, please don't use it as your grad school writing sample because it looks weird. Um, outside of the campus, I mean, really it's the same thing, but less formal. You, you wanna be the gadfly and not the, the lecturer. Um, uh, you know, in union meetings, in places of worship, at Thanksgiving dinner, you know, I, it's not just about, but it's not just about listening to people. It's about listening to people and then asking why. It's a sort of guided dialogue. Right, because we shouldn't actually discount the kind of training you get, being an academic and being a philosopher. That that's real, okay. And I would insist upon that. But yes, you have to be receptive to the raw material, to what people actually feel in their life experiences, and then you ask them why they believe these things, and you ask them why they think that they can go from these experiences, often traumatic ones, to political opinions which might actually not be on target might be anti-immigrant, might be xenophobic, might be pro-war, okay? And, and instead of lecturing them and saying, no, this is wrong, this is bad, and of sort of bad moralism, you, just like the geometric essay, you interrogate. You ask, like, so do those connections actually make sense? Right? Does the idea that there aren't sufficient uh, employment opportunities actually lead to the conclusion that there are, let's say, uh, too many people or too many people coming over the southern border? Or like, you know, might there be other factors at play here? And uh, when you open yourself up like that, people get scared. Okay, but if you're friendly and you show them that you're in fact on their side, because, you know, as abrasive a personality as I am, I generally am on their side. Okay, um, they're willing to experiment a little. They're willing to venture ideas and hypotheses. They're willing to put forward arguments. We need to get back to making arguments. That's the thing that the left is missing. It's not the sort of, uh, you know, uh, luxuriating in uh, past discourses, though those are sometimes very useful and sometimes very potent, but it's arguments. It's the ability through argument to discern what present ideas and indeed what past experiences and vocabularies are useful and why in a justifiable way. It's, it's the ability to discern you know, why our enemies are wrong and we're right. Mm. Wow. I want to thank you both again for coming on the, the program here. Um, for everyone listening, I think this was a tour de force. We're over two hours. Uh, I want to close here. Uh, encourage everyone listening either on podcast to give us a five-star rating, uh, to like it and share it, of course, on YouTube as well. Um, this is the first of many debates and discussions to come. 
And the, the readings, by the way, will be provided on our Patreon. So you can kind of go to the Patreon. I release all of my interviews and discussions early on Patreon. So if you become a member, you can only become, you can become a member for $1.50 to $10 a month. Um, Max, Landon, bravo. Um, thank you. This is a great example. Uh, we must do more of this. So thank you for coming on my show and for sharing uh, your philosophy, your insights, and your, your wisdom with us. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you so much. Till next time, everybody.